Where does this rank in your life, in your career, getting to be the first NASCAR driver at Le Mans? And, you know, how, how special? Well, I'd say second uh, in my life. This induction is first. So it's made a lot. Because I work so hard. And I race so hard, you know. I'm sorry. So I'm looking forward, but it'll be second in my life, regardless how good it is. Maybe when I come back, I'll say it's first. But we're we'll on another month or so. So Andretti and Foyt had both raced at Le Mans, but they're IndyCar slash crossover drivers. You're the first NASCAR full-time driver to race at Le Mans, and you're the last one left. Has that, how does that weigh on you? What, is, what are your personal thoughts about looking back at that and, and where it is now? Well, um, I didn't, I think what happened, I didn't really realize how important it was and how prestigious it was to go to Le Mans, you know. I just took it as, well, it's another race, you know, but it's a longer and that, and that type of thing. But uh, I look back at it and I think, well, uh, it's history. And I'm glad, I'm sure glad I did it. I'm not, I'm not happy with the results of the first one. Uh, the second one I did pretty good. We, uh, Dick Brooks and I, we drove a car together and we finished the race. Uh, uh, we had uh, a serious breakdown for a while in the transmission, but we finished, got it put back together and went in. So, and then sometimes I wonder, why did I take three motors? I'd have, all I needed was one motor to practice with, change it and race for the other one. <laughs> so, but I had three with me. So, uh, I was, when you look back, it uh, really is history. Uh, and I'm glad to be able um, to still be here and talk about it. Uh, you know, you look at the picture of the Formula One drivers alongside of you, and uh, not too many of them are alive, and I'm older than all of them, you know, at that time the picture was taken. So uh, I'm happy to be here. And you get to go back? And I get to go back. This is going to be uh, such a thrill for me. Uh, I just don't know what all is going to happen over there because uh, I think it's going to probably be probably a lot of PR with me coming. And uh, and I and I want to meet uh, uh, the president, of course. I've been trying to think, Mr. Uh, Macron. Mm -hmm. I want to say Emerald. His first name is uh, I had it down pat, but uh, I'm sure he'll be there. And I'd like to shake his hand, talk about 47 years ago, because he's a young guy. Everybody's younger, you know. Obviously, it's been a good good year for you. You uh, started off with the Hall of Fame in Charlotte, and, yep. and now you're uh, now you're you know looking forward to going back to Le Mans. This will be what your third trip. But yep. what was it like starting the year off at the Hall of Fame and then getting and coming and knowing you're fixing to go to Le Mans? Oh, this year, well, it was very exciting. Of course, I had to change my speech. Um, I had in my speech that I would I would sure like to go to Le Mans. So I'm going to ask Jim France. And uh, John Doonan, the MC guy, during my speech said, I would sure like to go. I would welcome an invitation. Well, the night before <laughs> we had dinner, I sat with Jim at dinner when he presented us the jackets. And so we talked about it then, and he says, I think we can make that happen. So I already knew when my speech, so when I said the speech, I thanked him, however, whatever I said, I don't remember. But it wasn't on the bored. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to take you had to take it out. Right? But they were reading your mind. They knew that you'd want to go back. Pardon? They knew that you would want oh, to go they, back. Oh, yeah. And I, and, I, and I told them, uh, I said, I don't really want to be a spectator. I would like to be part of the team. I'm sure there's something I could do that would be helpful. 
And that's what I'm looking forward to. I don't know what it is, but they got my shirt sizes. <laughs> and Jim says, well, you might end up being a fourth driver, kidding me, of course. You know, better have a uniform that fits. So I think I could be helpful somewhere in the pit area doing things that, uh, because I've been around so much, I know what they need, pretty much. Explain to people that may not know who Herschel McGriff is about your life and how you became a NASCAR racer and how you became legendary in this sport. Yeah, well, um, it just goes back a long ways. You know, World War II was on um, um, 1945. Uh, after the war was over, there was a little ad in the paper in Portland. I was 17 at the time, and they were going to have a race. None of my family's ever raced or anything, but I borrowed a car and got in that, and of course that hung me up. And so I've always been a weekend racer and uh, race in Portland and Winston West. The problem probably with, with my lifestyle, I stayed on the, on the West Coast. We did not get the publicity that they get on the East Coast. NASCAR was, was on the West Coast, but not strong. So that's why when they play the movies of the back in the years in the 60s, 70s, you never see any movies of my car. Uh, and the races on the West Coast, they're always on the East Coast because that's where the, the, the big stuff was going on. But meanwhile, I'm progressing through, you know, and I won the championship, I won a lot of races, and a lot of short track races, kind of know how many dozens that I won, uh, small tracks, and I could always seem to get through the crowd pretty good. So uh, that's what, I guess, made me legendary. And my age, I kept racing, you know, when I was older than most guys quit. Uh, but I always worked during the week and raced on the weekend, so, uh, and I was always in good shape. I was a runner for 30 years. I ran four miles a day, three or four days a week, so I really kept in good shape. I'd get in the car and drive 500 laps, didn't, didn't bother me any, so I could go back to work Monday morning. So that's about it. You were doing cardio running before anybody knew what you were supposed to be doing to get in shape to race a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, the race car did that. So, and you know, back in the days when I was driving, there was no power steering either. Um, I was, when I, the first time, when I went to Darlington the first time, I was 22 in 1950 old, there was no power steering. And I don't know, that didn't come out till I, I think probably in the 60s or maybe later. So, you know, you had to muscle them cars. So uh, I was able to do that without any problem. And you worked, I think you said you owned a, um, a sawmill or, or yeah, a well, yard? Yeah, I had a lumber manufacturing plant um, out of uh, in Bridalville, Oregon for years. And we had a shop there and we kept a race car there. And, my, and both my boys ended up racing as they got older, too. So, uh, you know, we worked during the week and, and uh, went racing on weekends all the time. Had a good time. Family was always involved. I had two daughters and they were involved. Of course, one daughter married to Chuck Ballin, who was a Bush champion back in the 90s. So uh, that's where it's been. It's been, it's been a great life. Let me tell you something you probably don't know. Okay, this picture here. Yes, sir. This is 1954 in Charlotte, half mile dirt, and I won the race. This is Sarah Christian, Frank Christian's her husband, who owned the car. Sarah Christian is on the Pioneer ballot this year. She drove a few races back in 49 or 50. I remember 50. that, I knew that. I knew that okay. from the history of NASCAR. Okay, isn't that kind of interesting? That's right. I was surprised to see her on the ballot, yeah. She's probably going to get in. There's so many people that deserve the Pioneer thing that it's almost hard to vote, you know. It was hard for me. I picked out, the, you know, we all picked out five. But uh, there's so many that aren't going to make it, you know. And I think it's fortunate that I got in because I'm alive. Because out of that pioneer, there's, I don't know how, the, what those percentages are dead. Hard for them to get up and say anything, you know, other than their relatives. You still are very active in the sport. Well, yeah, I have to give up at all, you know. I, uh, you just, 
you think I could go out, you always think that you could go out there and do what them guys are doing, but you know, it's not possible anymore. And uh, that's why the guys that quit even in their 40s, uh, or maybe early 50s, that they go back and try it again, it don't work. It doesn't work, usually. So, uh, it's, it's just too technical, and uh, the way the kids are learning to drive now with all the videos and stuff, it's uh, tough to compete, you know, so. But I think Le Mans is a difference, all road course, you gotta keep your mind shifted. I don't know about the transmission and stuff, it's gotta be easier the way it is. You know, we had, you know, we had to bang it in, you know. Uh, uh, back then there was no sinker mesh, really. So, you know, you had to hit the gears just right with the clutch and stuff. So it was a lot of foot action. And they don't have that now. Uh, so it's got to be a pleasure. I, mean, <laughs> I would love to get in that car and make a few laps. You know, not to try to go fast or anything, but just, I hope maybe that opportunity might come. Who knows? Yeah. I was going to ask you, how uh, special would it be if you could get in either that in, in, in either the Camaro, the Garage 56, or even in the, the replica car to make some more laps. Okay. Yeah, well, that would be neat, yeah. Because that car is raceable. The car that's over there, the replica, you know, they do the, these Le Mans races in six-hour periods of sports car guys. They have different old cars and so forth. Um, and that's what he uses this car for. He's given up some of it just to have it in the tent and uh, so people could see it and so forth. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> I know that. I'd like to get in a 56 car. That's the one that would, uh, because they're so different, you know, and uh, I, can't, I can't imagine how that thing drives, probably, you know, compared to what I've driven before. It looks like a spaceship inside. <laughs> I, I, bet it, I bet it does. You're, you're 95, right? And yeah. but at 100, <laughs> Hendrick and Rick Hendrick and Richard Childers both stepped up and said, "If you make it to 100, well, when you make it to 100, they're going to build you a race car yeah. and race." Are you serious? Is that a serious deal? Well, they both promised me a car. Bill McAnally furnished me a car when I was 90, when I drove a Tucson, and he says, "If you make 100, I'll I will do this again." Well, meanwhile, I'm at Sonoma a couple of years ago. And Richard Childers, we're doing a thing up on the stage before the driver's meeting. And, uh, and some fan says to me, you think you'll ever drive again? And I kiddingly says, well, I might drive when I'm 100. Richard Childers turned around and shook my hand. He says, if you do, I'll furnish the car and all the crew. <laughs> and he shook my hand in front of the camera. <laughs> so I got two cars going. Now, I don't know if that'll ever happen. If, you know, it's something I can have a lot of fun with, but uh, who knows? Hey, they're both Chevrolets and they're both uh, well to do in the yeah. store. They can make this happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we can make it happen. And now it might, might come pretty quick. I'm going on 3096, you know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You're four years away. And yeah, what, what would be a racetrack you would want to race at 100? Uh, that, that's something I haven't figured out. Uh, Kirk Chevrolet, he wants to be on my crew. Um, he said this back in the induction, and they well, what track would you pick? I said, well, I'd have to think about that. I don't know. Uh, probably a good half a mile somewhere, you know. A short track. Uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I want to move to the, the, 70, the 1976 24 Hours. Tell me a little bit about how all this came together. I mean, I know what happened at Daytona with the 24 Hours, but you were good friends with Bill France, and uh, my understanding is it was like, you were one of the picks. The first two, like I guess the first two cars couldn't make it. Uh, it was like the first three got to go to Le Mans. The first two couldn't go. Then you were the third. And then Don Lovey was, uh, his, his team was, was picked later. But what was that like? What was that process like? And were you like, hey, I want to go, I want to go? <laughs> no, I don't remember any of that. I mean, I didn't know people that was picked ahead of me. Oh, really? To go. Uh, and of course, I was there. I ran 15 hours there, and uh, and we broke down. So, because actually, I, I didn't really want to go to France to start with, because then I missed Riverside, and I've won a lot of races. I usually only won the Saturday race, you know, and I, I so I missed that weekend there. But uh, I'm not too sure who it was that. Uh, then we made the arrangements, of course, to go, 
And we decided instead of taking the Chevelle, which is a smaller car, we'd take that Dodge. The Dodge was more impressive, a bigger car, noisier, and you know, with a, with a big, big motor in it and stuff. So my son had one. So we used my son's car. That's the one we took over there. Uh, and I worked through with NASCAR. I, you know, I don't know who it was that that was my reliance for money and uh, making arrangements and so forth. But, you know, I actually didn't cost them much. I, I uh, actually, I think the figure was around 80000 which is nothing. <laughs> and nowadays, but see, the fr I, we fixed the car myself. We owned the car, so we didn't have to buy anything. We did buy extra wheels and a few things like that. And uh, a couple motors had to buy the parts for. I had a sponsor for a motor, put the motor together. So uh, Winston Cigarettes owned the freight line on the boat. So the containers was probably a free deal for NASCAR. So I, I had a trailer built and we hauled the car to the East Coast on a trailer with my pickup that I drove personally. And, uh, and they loaded it up there over there. And then they brought it back, and we brought it back home that way. So, uh, but but who I dealt with out of the NASCAR office for sending me the checks and so forth it might have been Jim Hunter, and I mean, most of the, all these guys are gone now or retired out of there. Yeah, you're you're one of the few left of the of the group. Pardon? I said you're really one of the few left of the group of of people from back in that day. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's all new people now. And, of course, they, a lot of them don't know me, but you know, Bill France Jr., he came over there, and he came over with a, with the fellow that was ahead of Union Oil. And uh, I think it was you know, probably Union Oil's airplane that they come over in. And uh, so, so Bill Jr. was right there with us all the time, and, and, and I, was, I was totally embarrassed of what happened. You know, we got a, I had a problem between com communication with the engine builder on the octane of the fuel. I don't know how that hell happened. But of course, it, I was responsible. I was the owner and so forth. So we did everything in our power to try to make it work over there with the engines, hex or head, 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 head gasket and so forth. But the motors were built for like 91 and that stuff was only like 83. So the fuel was really weak. So that's why we couldn't run much. So that was gonna be my, one of my questions was, Something, there's one report that said it was an oil leak, but truthfully, it was the, the octane levels didn't match. The motor basically imploded, and that caused the oil leak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it burnt the pistons right out. The pist I could run about three laps and it burned the piston out. So I practiced on one, qualified, and I let my son practice on the third engine, on the second engine. And the third engine we put in for the, I started the race with, I'd ran three or four, I don't know how, 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 how long I ran before it burned up. Two laps. Okay, yeah, two laps. But that thing would go, we, you know, we did, uh, we were the third fastest down the Mulsanne Strait, three, two, 227. Wow. So, you know, the Dodge, and the, but you know, they did it, for, as far as publicity, that Dodge made the front page of the main papers every day. They were there taking pictures of up on the jack stand, changing the motors and doing this and that. So I think it brought a lot of attention. And of course, they loved the sound. Going down that big block, you know, uh, you know, instead of a, like sounding like a bus saw like the rest of them sports cars do, <laughs> this thing really was really healthy. Seventy-seven. I don't know whether I'm probably passing him because <laughs> I'm underneath. They see I'm going to maybe run him out. Then that's that's my other. Okay. And then this picture here is the Dodge before we left to go to Le Mans. Uh, this is in Portland, Oregon, and this was a scenic site up. This is the Columbia River, and uh, that's me and my son before we loaded up to leave. And this picture here is. Uh, at Le Mans. Here's one of the headlines that I saw, and it said, Herschel McGriff brings monster motor to Le Mans. <laughs> yeah. That was true, so we had a lot of fun with it. It was a shame, 
it's, it's a shame we didn't get to run the whole race. And, and um, I'm sure we'd have, we would have, wouldn't have been too far back. That thing had a lot of speed. You were a driver and your son was a driver. You, you talked about this being a family experience and a family operation. How special was it to be able to do that with your son in one of the most iconic races in, in the world? Yeah, well, we're pretty close. And he's, uh, uh, and he was always a good driver. He was the same as me, he worked. And, and, but he was also able to build a car. Uh, he was very mechanical. Uh, both my boys are, but I'm not a mechanic. I, not that I didn't like to get dirty, but I just have never taken on the mechanics role. So uh, I think that's why maybe Bill France picked me out to do PR work and stuff back in the 50s, because I was clean, wore and dressed nice, and, and could present myself uh, uh, pretty good. So, uh, But in France, it was the same thing. I, I had trouble going after parts. In the front, I, they couldn't. It's not like Mexico. You can in Mexico, you can make them understand what you want. In France, I, I see. I needed some little piece. I had to go back without it. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I've been dealing with trying to get credentials and licensing for the next next couple of weeks over there, and it's not their fault. It's my fault. I am oblivious when it comes to speaking yeah. French. Yeah. And I hope I have not frustrated them. So if, you know, they're watching this at some point. I, I really appreciate their efforts for yeah. what they've done yeah. oh, to yeah. help me yeah. with uh, with all of this because it has yeah. it, it, it has not been easy to communicate and you know yeah. we we don't know French they know English but we don't yeah. know yeah. French yeah lucky for me that uh, 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 Kelly from NASCAR has been taking care of all my stuff so uh, it's pretty easy for me this year they got all the credentials little place to stay and yeah. transportation this year, yeah nine seventy six. <laughs> So, because uh, I guess I deserve it, you know, after I'm 95 and, uh, and I've done a lot uh, at NASCAR all my life, so uh, they appreciate it. It's nice to be recognized, you know. Up until a couple of years ago, not too many people knew me, really. Uh, I go on the East Coast, well, who's he, you know, type thing. And I sit alongside Richard Petty and he signs his name and, and I'm sitting next to him and they walk off. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time. There's always a few people that, that follow you pretty close. And I've got some really uh, nice letters, especially since I've been inducted. How were the French, how did they treat the American teams and you and when you got over there? What was that like? They couldn't do enough for you. It, it was, uh, uh, we had, we stayed in the villa, uh, not too far from the track and so forth, you know. And of course, I was always, Bowled it down with a car, so I spent my time at the track most of the time. Uh, not out for any fancy dinners or anything that much. So, so you didn't go out. I heard that a lot of the teams went out to Paris and had a, a grand old time. As, uh, <laughs> we didn't. Your... I don't remember doing that. So, uh, now when I went over there in '82, uh, I was single at the time, so. Uh, even uh, even then, I don't remember doing too much. But I looked at the girls a lot more, <laughs> and they and they had a lot of them there walking around the track with them little short skirts, you know. So uh, oh, yes, the whole thing's fun. Yeah, they make a fun out of it. You mentioned two twenty seven on the Molson <laughs> Strait earlier. What was that like going down the Molson Strait? You know? uh, man, it was really fast. But uh, the trees were going by really fast. They're right next to you, you know, going down there. The problem, <laughs> you know, they had a driver's meeting. How many hundred people are in the driver's meeting? First thing they said, they wanted, they got up and complained about my Dodge. Got to put mirrors on it, big mirrors. Because, see, I had to start stopping. <laughs> I couldn't stop like they could when I got down to the end of the straight. So I had to start stopping way back, you know. Uh, didn't even have disc brakes yet, you know, in them days. So, um, we put mirrors on it. So, because the back end's so high, when they were behind me, I couldn't tell that. I couldn't see them. Of course, and I'm, a lot of them I'm passing, even in practice, I'm passing going down there. So that was a big thing, you know, uh, the drivers made it, okay, we'll put mirrors on, and we did that. And so, um, but we could watch it out the side, so it didn't cause anybody else a racing problem. When uh, 
you know, you knew you had a fuel issue. You knew the octane and the motor was going to go. But you still made that up. You still made the start. You still went out there and ran it. You, you could have pulled out, but you ran it. Oh, so yeah. Good. Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to go to the last. <laughs> Even if I didn't have two or three pistons, I still wanted to go, but I got done going too slow, so I had to stop. Uh, when that happened, what went through your mind? Well, I was kind of sick about it, you know. Uh, but it happened, and uh, Bill Frantz Sr. And, or Jr. was uh, uh, very compliment me on the way, way it handled. And in fact, they got a lot of PR out of it, a lot of it, even though I didn't, you know, run the race ever very long. So, so I was, uh, uh, I didn't get, I didn't get depressed or anything. I, I, I'm not that kind of guy. So I just take it and move on. You weren't last. Just for the record, the, uh, the, 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 the team of uh, Jacques Marche, Mar uh, uh, Marsha Deland, and Max Cohen Oliver, Oliver um, they were in a Tommaso uh, uh, Pantera. They oh. couldn't start the race. Their car wouldn't oh. even start. So they were 56 credited. You were 55th. Hey, so I'm you, glad to hear that. You weren't last. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I didn't know that. They did not. I learned something every day. Yeah, so. they, yeah. I, I looked it up this morning before I came over yeah. here. Uh, the, they are credited. Uh, according to Racing Reference, they are credited with 56 for not and not starting, uh -huh. and you're credited for 55th with oh, two laps yeah. in. Oh yeah, I'll be darned! I didn't know that. So you can tell, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. A little bit of redemption there. Yeah, oh yeah. So this is the part where I've got to make sure see if I got paid for 55th. That's a good point. Yeah, so I have to check that out. Interest rates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did it pay? What did it pay? Oh, I don't know. I, I, didn't, I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, I don't think it's a big money thing. It's all about uh, it's prestige. prestige. Yeah, if you win that race, that's, uh, that's a big thing, you know. So Al Pierce wanted me to remind you. He said, you saved his life at Le Mans, basically. Because he was sick of drinking warm French champagne and wine, <laughs> and you had cold Olympia beer. <laughs> Fit. And yeah. he was always going through there. He said, "He said I had, that was the only thing I could get to drink over there. They yeah. had a bottle of water back in '76." Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, he was. You know, he likes to drink. <laughs> <laughs> and and we did. We got it. We took a lot of Olympia beer uh, with us. I don't know how we had it packed up, but uh, yeah. and boy, the guys that you know they'd come walk from a long ways to come and try to get a cold beer from us, so just to taste it. And, and uh, something that was different from the French. Something different than warm French wine and champagne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, uh, talk about your sponsor, because Olympia did, they were on the car, and you, you, that's very important, and you know, to have that support. Um, you know, it, it takes that to, to make something like this happen. Yeah, NASCAR was helping to cut the checks, and you, you said it didn't cost you a lot of money out of pocket, but there's still an investment. You miss Riverside, yeah. you know, how did that affect you? Yeah, yeah, but to have yeah. a sponsor, that would, would go along with something like that? Well, I, I, I think it didn't change. Uh, uh, Olympia Bird gave me so much a, a year, and so that was down pat. And uh, the more I raced, uh, the more publishers they, they got, and I got all the beer. <laughs> I, I got all the beer that uh, we needed uh, at the different racetracks. They would send the local dealership in and, and bring cases into my motel rooms everywhere that I went, you know, so uh, there was always plenty to give away. Riverside particularly, uh, the truck always went down to the pit and then and would put the NASCAR tech truck uh, with a lot of beer so they could, when they went back east, they could, they could work on that for a while. That happened every year for several years, so. So basically a lap at Le Mans is about three and a half, four minutes. So you made two laps. What'd you do for the next 23 hours and 51 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hung around. I stayed there. I stayed there. I was there all the time. And because uh, I helped, uh, after it was all over, I helped load the car back in the, in the container. And uh, that was a job because it was, I couldn't speak English. I mean, I couldn't speak French to the guys that was tying it down stuff. So 
but I got it done. So I knew how to do all that stuff. Were you and Don Levy friends? And I know you, Dick Brooks and you were friends. But were you and his team, were y'all friends back then? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, we were not real close because he was East Coast, I was West. But no, we knew them all. And uh, I was thinking I almost was going to drive his car one time. And it ended up never happening. But he, uh, he was a good guy. He was a good NASCAR owner. Owner, very good. Yeah, you got to do the ultimate. You're the team owner and the driver. Pardon? I said you got to do the ultimate. You're the team owner and the driver. And the driver, yeah. I had, um, that was a lot of responsibility when I look back uh, as the owner and, and the drive and the crew. I had one guy on my crew that was, uh, he was the guy that actually put the, kind of prepared the car with the lights and all that stuff we did to it different. Uh, he was just negative, and I and I had 19 people there total, including some of the guys' wives and stuff that went over there, and uh, that one person made it tough on me, uh, you know, before the race to get everything ready because he didn't agree with anything, you know. And of course, I wanted things my way because I owned it, so he had to do that, but it wasn't easy. But we had to have. Uh, radio, you know, we had radios uh, uh, that they could talk on the cor different corners if they have a problem. So I had to take guys over to do that. Other than that, I was basically had about five guys that did the work on the car. When you heard that NASCAR and Hendrick were sending a Garage 56 entry again uh, for the 75th anniversary of NASCAR, the 100th running. Uh, you know, 100th anniversary, the centenary of the Le Mans this year is the 100th for them. What were your first thoughts? Well, you know, I had to go back with a friend of mine, Dick Pearson. Dick Pearson is about 70-some uh, now. He's the one that drove the, the truck across the United States to put it in a container. He's been going to Le Mans. He got acquainted with a guy over there. They built this, this uh, replica car. That was built in Portland. And uh, he, he made the negotiations for this French owner who owns the car now, yet. And uh, he's been in contact with all these people. So I knew, he, he told me all about Garage 56 before it ever got going too much. He seems to, he seems to know, he knows the right people. And in fact, he's been to Sebring and watched him practice with it so far. He got acquainted with the drivers and the picker and so forth. And he's gonna be there. So uh, 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 he, I get a lot of my information from him and I'm not too sure where he gets it all. So, any advice you have for Jimmy Johnson or Rock or, or, or Jensen on, on what, you know, you say you want to be a driver coach. What, uh, what <laughs> advice do you have? Well, I, didn't, I think maybe uh, enthusiasm and pep talks and stuff to keep their, uh, keep their spirits up if the car's not like they want it or something. I think I can help in that area. So, And I hope my ring is showing up in this conversation. I, I'm flashing it around because I'm very, I'm very proud of it. And you can't imagine what that cost me. <laughs> Probably. But I, uh, I've always been a happy guy and uh, not negative. And uh, I think if any of that's going on in the pit crew and stuff, I can, I can be helpful that way. Not that I think it would. And I think everybody should be. This is going to be such a great deal. And I can't believe how many people are going to be there between Goodyear and Hendrix and, uh, you know, Rick Hendrick doesn't really know me particularly, but, you know, I saw him drive a sports car once back in Riverside. He drove a, uh, on, a, in the, on the Saturday race years ago uh, before, you know, so he was a driver too, along with Roger Pinsky. Right. <laughs> I go back that far to watch Roger Drake. <laughs> so, you know, I know a lot of stuff. Yeah, probably the, all the people on the on this team of Garage Fifty Six really don't know me. You know, unless they read something. So I'm anxious to see them. Uh, 
Jimmy um, Johnson. Of course, I've met him. I just seen him the other day at uh, Darlington. And uh, Rocky, uh, the UK driver. Um, I'm anxious to see him. And the third driver is who? Jensen Button. Uh, Button. Button, yeah, Jensen Button. I'm anxious to meet Button. Him and I will get along great. Uh, He's I, a character. I've been watching him on the news, on Formula One and stuff, and uh, I know that uh, we'll click really good. And uh, who knows, I might give him some driving points just for kicks. <laughs> Jim France on the stage, and he had all these chairs set up. Well, I always got called first, I guess, because I was the oldest one. So, and but this is, this is, it's a stopwatch. It's not a watch, it's, it's a, a stopwatch. Stop yeah. So everybody got one of these. And Jim would hand you the box and you sit down. There's 10 chairs. There's 10 chairs there. And then the rest of the guys come up, you know, like, um, all the guys that are retired now, but it ended up being 31. I don't know exactly how many of the first 50 is there. I think quite a few, like Red Farmer and sure. so far, so far. And uh, Rusty Wallace, I'm, I'm not too sure. He might have been one of the first 50. Guys like that. Out of the 31, I'm the only person Jim France hugged. Wow. <laughs> he likes you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't know that, but my wife did. She says, when I sat down, she says, you know that Jim's the only one that hugged you. <laughs> yeah, hey. I'm huggable. You're huggable. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, I'm going to put that in my car. And, and if I pass somebody, I'll time them or do whatever. I'll have to play with it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's got, it's got a, I've had to put a chain on it. It's already, it's already got, oh, it's got a ribbon, see? Yeah, so, but it's got a name. They, I mean, NASCAR goes first class when they give you a sap, you know? Uh, I mean, look at the, look at the hands there, boy, you can see that. Let's zoom in on that real quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, neat. That is, uh, that's really neat there. Yeah. Well, that's how they did stuff in those days. You know, they sit around and I could, Dale Emmon could come with his, you know, Richard out there timing Richard all the time. But just boom, I mean, need to get it right on, you know. <laughs> we don't get gifts like that in NASCAR anymore. Uh, well, uh, I, you do. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it safe to say that NASCAR, like, basically through your racing, built? everything we see your whole life? Uh, pretty much, uh, pretty much. Because, of course, being on the West Coast, we were a little bit behind. But then, you know, when, when, when NASCAR used to come to Riverside and Ontario, and now, of course, Auto Speedway and then Las Vegas and so forth, they needed the West Coast guys. There wasn't enough East Coast guys would come. You know, they may have 25 cars, but they needed 40 or 35 or 40. So that gave Winston West guys a chance to, to, to race with them and, and uh, go through all their tech procedures and stuff, all that. So, uh, of course, that don't happen anymore because uh, the, uh, the series, the ARCA guy, what they call ARCA was Winston West now. Uh, different kind of car. Uh, but we were running the same thing back then days in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So. You have any nerves going back? Any what? Any nerves? Any jitters? Is it? <laughs> no, I never got nervous. I could go to sleep. I could sit in a car before a race and go to sleep. You know, it was just the way, the way things were. It was always nice to know you were ready to go. Yeah. What about this time? Now you're, yeah, you're going to be the uh, Mr. PR guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just have to realize that... Uh, my racing days are over, pretty much, you know. So uh, I, I, keep, uh, I keep good cars to drive. And, uh, and um, you know, the speed thing, actually, I'm, I'm more careful driving now on the street than I, than I have been. 
because uh, what happens is people, if something does happen, well, it's because he's so old. And I had some lady call me up from a, from a radio, uh, from a TV station from LA the other day. I says, I'm on my phone. She says, I said, well, wait a minute. I'll pull over if I want to talk a little bit. Oh, she says, you mean you're driving? <laughs> I says, yeah, yeah, I've been, to, I've been downtown in Tucson. I've got to go 40 miles back home. <laughs> it ruined her conversation because she knew I was 95, but some movie actor had had a, a minor wreck, and he was 96. I can't think of his name. So she was calling, asking me if the older guy should quit driving when, see. Well, it killed her. It killed her. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. So I just try to be more careful because you know I, I live in a in a in a town that's uh, it's all seniors and and some of them are poking around. You have to watch what they're doing. You know they'll run right into you. You know or get in the wrong lane and they don't look. But you know they they still don't want to give up. So I don't think there is any age limit because. Um, uh, I'm probably a lot better driver than the most 50 year olds, you know, as far as um, probably couldn't tell them that, but uh, I, I think it's as to who you are. I just, I checked out your cars a while ago. You have a Maybach, a Mercedes Maybach. <laughs> I didn't see any scratches on anything, so apparently you're pretty good. And you got a motorcycle. It's only three weeks old. Three weeks old? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, the other one, the, the other one's going to leave Monday. The uh, the S sixty five is is uh, uh, thirteen years old. It don't look like that, but it's been a really nice car. Anyway, my daughter is gonna, uh, her, her husband's coming after it Monday, so it will be out of here. And I just I just got the other one. I went on a cruise at the uh, in, in in the Panama Canal a couple of weeks ago, and I got it the day before, and so it's been sitting in the garage. I've only driven it a couple of times. Wow, nice car. Nice car. Well, you're not done driving because you, in four years, you're going to be driving in as a 100. Yeah. We're going to be racing somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll be back for yeah. that. Yeah. I, and, and I think I, uh, if I do that, I will be prepared for it. Um, I'll probably uh, run a late model out here for a while and, you know, just to get in practice, get in shape, make sure I could go. Because I don't want to get in and just circle around a little bit, you know, and have some fun with it. Yeah, that'll be the main thing, because it's got it's all over, yeah. <laughs> all over the world will know uh, what I'm doing. Yeah, it will make and so it'll and, be world news. And I gotta keep in shape, you know. I love I love food. I love to eat, so I have to watch the the middle part here and uh, the hangover. So, but I'm pretty good. I you know for being. I just don't walk very good, uh, but uh, other than that, I just don't walk to get around faster and to keep from falling. Right? Right. The falling is the worst part, they say. So, uh, and, and, and I tell you what, when I go out there and lay down under one of them cars, it's hard to get up. <laughs> I mean, it really is. So I always have a little bench around it because my arms you can lean on, but it's a difference when you're 95 than when you're your age.